guys, it's Cindy and Michael from Part Time Permies. And if we could get a verification that we have sound, it looks like we should. Um, and then we'll get going here. But it does look like we have a number of people in the room. Uh, do you want to say hi to anybody? We have Incense Shop and 13 Moons and Curie from Built on the Rock Homestead. And you want to keep reading them? Ouch. Sorry. What's that? You can keep reading them. Pick out I, a few. I was, I was just reading. You were reading as we were going. I was reading what Kiri was writing. So. Uh, <laughs> Linda she Taylor. Put a big post she on. put a big post on. So you were being distracted. Linda Taylor, hello. And is it Delia Cortez? Um, hello, hello. And Kiri's posting away. And Tina, who's making locally sourced beef kielbasa for lunch this week. That sounds really good. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, I like kielbasa. Yeah. Uh, and 13 Moons, who's having coffee <laughs> tonight with our show. Um, so I'm wondering if 13 Moons might be in a different time zone than us, because <laughs> unless it's decaf. Um, but, and then your mom's in the room. <laughs> and yes, and my he, and she is right. My dad's birthday is today. He did end up not staying tonight. He they came last night and they left uh, a few hours ago. So, but we did get to celebrate that today. And it sounds like the sound is good. That's good because I've been talking a while. <laughs> um, what else were you reading? I missed. Watching your videos yesterday. Oh, 13 <clears throat> Moons. Talking to 13 Moons. Um, okay. I'm next to a goat farmer now at the farmer's market permanently this uh, Saturday, on Saturdays this yes. year. Yeah, we've but, talked about her before. Yeah, she's... so that's that's been a little bit different. Yeah. She gets up at 1.30 in the morning to start milking so that she can make it to market. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, Nuts. Yikes. I thought, you know, I'm on there. Or, well, we're all on the very early end. Everybody going to market is... Anybody who's doing anything other than having like preloaded crafts is, is getting up is early. Doing, <laughs> doing the really yeah. early. Yeah. yeah, get really early All load the farms, out. Yeah. Farms and the food vendors. Here, I'll give you a different piece of paper to put that on. Put that on there. Um, it is extremely humid today. No, we got thunderstorms coming soon. Yeah, we might get thunderstorms halfway through the show. So hopefully we keep our internet connection. Um, but we'll go as long as it doesn't cut out. Uh, so a little heads up on that if we start getting bad weather. But if we cut out, I do apologize. If not, then that's awesome. Um, yeah, forget that. It's too early. <laughs> I agree. It's too early. For getting up at for oh, market yeah, that yeah. early. <laughs> yeah, I know. She was, <clears throat> she was telling me, how, well, she was birthing a lot last week. Oh, uh, yeah. I guess most, she likes to do late spring and end of summer um she does her timing different than most people okay and or she does no she does middle of winter spring yeah so she says she does not doesn't affect her outcomes and she really likes the um that time she like yeah she that time rotation works better for her yeah i think she gets better Carrie milks once a day right now early evening or late afternoon do you do kid sharing um Curie, because I know a lot of people do that, but not everybody does. I don't know what this farmer does. Um, I, yeah, I don't know what else she does. Yeah, so, but, yeah, no, I had a lot of people. Plus, that that market is really early compared to a lot of markets. Well, it's, a, it's a 7 o'clock start, but you yeah. have, depending on where you're located, you have to have your vehicle out of your area by either 6.30 or you have to arrive at 6.30 to get, because there's a vehicle Staggered swap. Staggered arrival. So yeah. that means people are getting in between 6 and 6.30. Some people are there earlier. Some people are there at 5 plus travel. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's an early. I mean, a lot of markets start at early. A lot of them start at 8. Kind of the, mm -hmm. the suburban markets start more like 8 uh, or sometimes a little later. But this is a traditional farmer's market, so they're still 7 o'clock. So Carrie says she definitely, definitely does kid sharing. Um, well, it makes it easier, I guess, also to go like on a vacation or whatnot, because then you just don't milk, you don't pull the kid off of them. You can leave them on them to milk, uh, get all the milk out. So, and the Max Happy Homestead, hello, hello. Um, <coughs> another person in the room. So, yeah, so we had 
a really busy weekend because my parents came to town yesterday. Uh, we had market in the, two markets in the morning. You were at one, I was at the other, which were really good. Yeah, well, uh, uh, I don't know how good, I and mean, they felt good. We didn't come back with a lot of product. Yeah. I got piles of paperwork on my desk, so I haven't finished that yet. Yeah. Usually by Sunday, I'm, markets are all squared away and getting ready for the next week, but I haven't touched them. And we have one more weekend of markets this month. Yeah, it's a five. It's a five Saturday weekend. Yeah, so it'll be a good month. month. So yeah, yeah. Missed uh, night market, which is our once a month uh, yeah. evening. We had serious flooding on Wednesday, and we're down by part of the tributaries to the river and the train tracks, and so they flooded out. You're in the flood zone. The parking it? lots, yeah. um, flash flood the parking lots. They closed the main road and a whole bunch of other roads. Started to shut down power. Yeah. Um, in that area, so. Uh, that was they, yeah. They cleared out the market, which would have had yeah. like four thousand people down there. That so. that night market is kind of like a party, party. with dinner. <laughs> yeah, it, it it has like a central courtyard area where they have musicians come in. They have a bunch of food trucks come in. They have local wineries and beer come in, so they get a liquor license for that one once a month. Charitable, yeah, they do a charitable liquor license, temporary liquor license for the day. And then they the have day. the market vendors under the, the um, what do you call it, pavilion around the courtyard. So it's it's a huge one. And unfortunately, that got canceled because on Wednesday night to Thursday, that was supposed to be Thursday night, Wednesday night to Thursday morning, if we had four inches of rain all at once. So we had a lot of flooding in the area, a yeah. lot of flooding. We already have some flooding in the area, but. So just one one area we've been watching for a year is there's a low area on a road close to I-94 that we drive by all the time. Yeah. And over the last year there, well, for more than a year, there's been a driveway that's been covered with water impasse while they've created another driveway. Mm -hmm. We've watched this pond area grow up to the road and then start to grow over the road yes. about two or three months ago. Yes. Right now it's at the very top of the guardrail. Yes. So whatever height, uh, you know, those, the top those of the galvanized are... guardrails are put yeah. in two and a half, three feet. The water is that far over the road right now. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. It's I don't nuts. think anybody's ever seen it like that and it's not going down. No, they're it's... just leaving it. Uh, they'll leave it for months until they can, there's yeah. nowhere to put the water. So. And there's a couple lakes nearby who have, about well, last I heard before that storm on Thursday, there were 24 houses flooded out on these two lakes, small lakes near us. So um, there are a lot of people who are not able to live at home in those lakes, but uh, or on those lakefront. So 13 properties. moons. We have the opposite problem. We've had so much rain and so much consistent rain every few days. Yeah. The farmers can't cut. They they miss their they hay. miss their whole first cutting of hay. Yeah. Should be into their second cutting. We and most of the farms can't cut because they can't get a three or four day gap to cut and bale even fresh hay, which means everybody's scrambling to get feed yep. uh, because they're long out of their winter feed. And so, you know, all the small farms that don't, if you're on pasture, it's great as long as you're not in mud. Uh, there's plenty to eat, but um, all the little hobby farms and everybody that depend on buying feed are scrambling around trying to find every grain and beet pulp alternative that you know is fit for their animal yeah uh, and the prices are super high right now so you'd think when you got all this rain you're gonna have great feed, you get great growth but <laughs> but they can't get it into bales no they can't get it dry enough to bale it but yeah no it is it is bad in this area um i know the prats were talking about uh, and a lot of the corn farmers couldn't get the corn in. There's in a time. lot of corn. I don't think quite yeah. ever made it in, and we're I think we're past the insurable dates. Yeah. So. Some of the farmers did get it in, so there are some. I've seen other people that pushed in corn and soybeans, though, that don't usually that had an opportunity. Yeah. I've seen some small farms that have taken advantage. They probably they think the prices will go high because of it. So I think yeah. so. There, I have seen some pop up corn in, in interesting places. Yeah. So. Oh, really? You're coming to Michigan in a few weeks? What, the Max what area? Happy big, Homestead uh, in a few weeks. Big state. Uh, it is a big state, but are you happen happening to come, come to, to the, the Hoot Nanny in a month? <laughs> that would be fun because we will be there too. I hope others in this room will be there. Um, so, yeah. But what area of Michigan? It is quite a large state, actually. Most people don't really think about it, but with both peninsulas, we have a lot of... 
land. <laughs> yes, tractors and trucks definitely get stuck. There are a lot yeah. of tractors that over the last month, you'll see them sitting in the middle of fields yeah. because they, they had gaps and they went out and they started to either turn soil or to plant and then they got more rain and they just literally have stopped tractors for days and weeks thinking they'd go back in in a few days. They're going oh, into good. the hoot nanny. Oh, we'll meet you there. Awesome. Where are you coming from? Yeah. Um, and yay. So what else was I going to say? Yeah, no, it also has made it hard to harvest strawberries. Strawberries are going to be a short, short season, which isn't uncommon for us. Yeah. We have some strawberries. Limited sun uh, for ripening and increased water for mold, mildew, and rot. Yes. So we've actually, we were having trouble harvesting our strawberries. We have wild strawberries that we transplanted. did a video on that about two years ago. And they're doing great, actually. And um, by the way, besides my parents coming to town, my sister and her daughter, one of my sisters and her daughter, came into town as well so they helped us harvest some strawberries earlier today it's supposed to be another rainy day today but they pushed it back to this evening it's a good thing because we, well, we really got some at, we got a, de a nice amount at in the five, morning five six in the morning yeah. yeah yeah and then it passed and then we missed the middle of the day so that's my niece holly and my sister deb who helped me get through that entire bed of strawberries, trying to pick any that are still good. There's a, We probably missed half of them, and there's not many more that are ripening up left in there. So I might be able to get a few more if I go back in there one more <laughs> time, if we have dry enough time. But um, we did get a number of strawberries. I did get out there once earlier this week, so I will show that's our wild strawberries that I harvested a couple days ago. Um, so I guess that was actually a few days ago, probably before our big rain, right? I forget. Maybe a day ago. Anyway, so we had some big, big wild strawberries this year, probably because of some of this rain. And then we picked a whole bunch more today. So we have um, a couple quarts of strawberries, I'd say now, which we're hoping to get three plus quarts of strawberries from the bed, but I'm not sure if... We're going to get there. We've got a little bit of stuff laying around from last year. We're going to whip it into a mixed berry, jam. wild berry jam. It'll be primarily the strawberries. So. Yeah. Oh, from Mississippi. Good. Oh, wow. That's a distance. I used to live on the Mississippi at one point. On the Mississippi, but not in Mississippi. No, not in Mississippi. <laughs> I uh, yeah. live in Memphis. Tennessee. <laughs> Memphis. Um, okay. Yeah. There's droughts causing feed it, uh, sweet, Swedish homestead feed shortage. Um, Last time we got a little rain like this, we popped to eight or ten weeks of almost no rain, Yeah, but that already had happened, so I don't know what's going on. For no, it. last year, the year before, we were in a drought. Yeah, it was really When the dry. roads came here, we it was went almost, extremely dry. We went almost ten, eight to ten weeks with very, very little rain. Yeah, and then last year, that's actually when the flooding started, was last spring, last year spring. Last winter, spring, yeah. Um, And that's when, yeah. The lake started overflowing. Right now, Lake Michigan is at an all-time high. We should go out and see where that water actually looks like it is at some point. We have to make that drive out there and get some pictures. So those of you that are familiar with South Haven, which is a vacation destination yeah. on the southwest side on Lake Michigan, so kind of across from Chicago, <laughs> but it's on the southern end of Lake Michigan, mm -hmm. um, they have a couple of piers and, and lighthouses and stuff. Um, the main South Haven pier is basically the water's almost at the pier, and that's never the case. Yeah. So they were saying. And sometimes it's going over the pier. Yeah, actually. they were saying a yeah. couple, about a week ago, that even two foot waves, which are not uncommon at all, in fact, that's yeah. close to normal uh, many days, unlike Michigan, will go over the pier, uh, and it's a, perm you know, it's a permanent concrete and moored. So they, with a lighthouse at the end of yeah, it. Yeah, so uh, that's been closed for a while, but they're telling people to stay off of all of them because even small mm -hmm. waves will sweep across. We were getting 10-foot waves um, with a storm and wind coming in a few few more days ago, and then that's when they were really saying stay off of the... Because uh, they're getting beach erosion, and all yeah. the docks are, are getting overswept that nobody would, would think about previously. Yeah, so I, I think it's probably going to be hard on their... Um, 
their tourist activity this summer because there's some I of the think, beaches are the problem, but the the big issue there they get a lot they of rip, get riptides. They get ripped both um, out and down the uh, the pier because there's there's um, the river comes out there yeah. and um, and then the dock changes the flow so it's you got to watch a little bit what's going on there yeah. sometimes. Hey, Green Gables. So yeah, but there's other nice beaches right along there, but they're all. Uh, but the water's all, uh, really high on a lot of them, so yeah. usually there's a lot of sand. The other thing is there's a cliff along a lot of that area yeah. from erosion. There's a 20, 30, 40 foot cliff. And the water doesn't usually all, always go all the way up. There's usually a large section of, of sand beach, so I'm not sure. Some of that may go from cliff to water, which yeah. does not make for any usefulness for for beach vacation <laughs> for vacationing. But yeah, there's other areas that are nice and sandy. Oh. So but, yeah, yeah, so it's really high. But of any of you guys coming to visit Michigan, I would recommend if you have time doing a trip to Lake Michigan because it does have really nice shoreline. There's some sand dune areas and all that. Um, so if you had to, it will warm up till the end of July, August. It, it gets well, warm at the but it, it's still, Annie's end of July. I know. So that's sort of the beginning of the good time. Yeah. Uh, because it's such a big body of water, it really takes a long time to warm up. But it, yeah. it's swimmable and it's warmer than some of the other Great Lakes. Oh, yeah. And on this side of it's sandy. Yeah. So Wisconsin side is not so sandy. Michigan side is very sandy. In fact, we're on basically sand here still. Um, which, by the way, did you know that that's part of the reason why Wisconsin had such a high... Um, they started making beer so much was one of the reasons was obviously there's a bunch of people from like German areas uh, moving this direction, but they were right across the lake from a huge sand dunes yep. where they could harvest a bunch of sand to bottle their beer. So they just ship it across the lake. Um, so it's kind of a, yeah, you can make bottles. And of course the water's been, the water's very good here because you have the sand filtered water. So yeah. it's, um, like Bell's brewery is in our area and we have a lot notoriously of notoriously little... good water. Although downtown Kalamazoo, the water's notoriously bad, which is odd because the water in this area is. Well, no, Kalamazoo did have a bad, but that's a city, city that's water a city issue. Problem. Not a... <laughs> um, and a river issue because yeah. there was a lot of paper mills that on our river at one point too. Um, Windows are being open. I'm being screamed at by a baby goat. <laughs> she can wait for her bottle after the show. That's too funny. Our geese sometimes scream at, scream at us, but usually get excited and scream at us when we come out because they think we're always bringing they food. They actually got to the point if we move the door. Yeah. They will start making noise. The back door. Actually, the door makes a noise. So. Yeah. They recognize that sound and they start going nuts and they think we're coming out to feed them, even if we're... Going to the garden or something else. <laughs> yeah. So they're, they're, they're funny. They're definitely creatures that are paying attention what's going on around them. Except for below them. Well, right now they're in knee-high barley straw. Yes. Barley. Yeah. I didn't uh, get a picture. higher. Of... It's almost waist-high barley that they're eating everything up. That we just moved them again. Yeah. So we, we move them either Sunday nights or Saturday. Or sorry. Saturday nights or Sunday mornings. And we got up this morning at like 5 30 in the morning to go move them um so they're on fresh fresh uh forage um and they have a ton of it where they are right now um i didn't take a picture of that move this morning but you know it's yeah, pretty so much similar to they're last under our apple trees now too yeah so moving in that area um so anyway we had so we're gonna do jam with the strawberries um we did eat, actually. It was kind of funny because you ha you hire a, how old is Holly now? Five-year-old. Is she five now? Yeah, she is. Um, you hire a five-year-old to come help pick strawberries. I did give her the little container because my theory was that uh, she would probably eat as many, at least as many as what she put in the container. And I think she ate more than what she put in the container. And I did have her go and bring those into grandpa, my dad, um, to share for his birthday. So that little container did not last, but we did fill a big container as well. So, um, editing a video the other day and the geese heard me say, Oh, I saw you write that nighty night on the video and they got excited and started heading to bed. 
It was morning. Ours aren't that trained. <laughs> Ours don't always go in at night. Uh, they Ours do have... doesn't go in at all. No, he doesn't go in in the summer at all. He sits in his pool and poops in his pool all night. Oh, my gosh. No, he actually, a lot of times, he sits right by the nursery coop where we have the silky babies because he just is in love with the silky babies. He loves babies, and he guards them like mad, uh, which is nice. But uh, he usually sleeps right by that I see him laying down in the evening time right by the coop end of there because he seems to know that they're inside the coop there. But they're in an electric poultry net, so they are protected. But, um, yeah. Got Lucky sometimes goes in the coop. He's been doing probably about half and half in the coop versus out. Uh, I think it just depends on the day. Uh, last time he slept outside the coop might have actually been that rainy night, and he's been sleeping in the coop since then. So I don't know if that – they don't mind the water. but Yeah, he can always go under the coop. Yeah, he can. He has some protections down there. It's for him to get under there. Yeah. They get food when she locks them in at night, so that's why they were going oh, okay. running there, of course. Um, yeah, so, okay. I did get a couple pictures. I didn't get a picture of the birthday boy. No, nope. no, I got a oh, video of him, which will not be released on this. It will be released later, so you guys have to be on the lookout for that one as well. That'll be a short little video, but um, we'll get that released probably either later this week or next week. Um, so he turned 81. 81 today. So we had a fairly local dinner tonight. You want to explain the ribs? Uh, those are just dry rub ribs and threw them on the smoker grill this morning, let them go for quite a while. And then I put just at the end when I brought the heat up a little bit and was cooking some other stuff, uh, threw on some barbecue sauce from Jimmy, Chef Jimmy Tebow, um, who is a notable chef in our area. And we had done some uh, things he's actually an instructor for a local high security or jail. Yeah. So he's got a very unique job. He instructs culinary, cooking with knives, full go, um, really good food they make. Uh, and I was down there on a program uh, assisting him and a whole bunch of other chefs, and we were all given some of his barbecue sauce. So I put a little of his barbecue sauce on, uh, and it's pretty good. Uh, and so later on, <laughs> if you want to talk about ribs, Something that people don't always talk about is the cuts and the different forms that you can get in pork ribs. To some degree, you can extrapolate These were that. These huge. Yeah. So we, but later on, if if some if people are interested, we can talk about which type of rib you want to purchase or what may be most cost effective or other things. So do you parboil? Uh, when I'm doing like um, four or five hundred pounds, I definitely do. Um, <laughs> on these, uh, they're they're dry rubs, so they're. Uh, slow smoke, 275 smoke. If For most of the day. Yeah, if you go a little lower, if you go like 250, then you can go almost all night. But I like about a six hour, uh, five or six hour, uh, two, 275. And I, you know, I can also talk, there's a few ways to play with that and speed it up or, or tenderize them. But yeah, parboil, when you got a lot of them, doing a real heavy seasoned herbed um simmer to get them going and then finishing in the oven or on the grill is the old, sort of the old classic american way um um other than the pit smoking method and it, it's a sure fire actually the biggest thing is to make sure you, they don't overcook and the bones fall out uh, so i would do that for like fourth of july when i had 900 or a thousand people and we had cases and cases of ribs um and they, and they still come out good um do the danish like boiled Danish ribs or things. Yeah, so it, it's a legitimate way to do it. Um, and it's actually easier in some ways to get a good result than doing yeah. a true true smoked Slow smoke rib. rib. Yep. Yeah. And there was another... Oh, more... and then you get a great pork broth that you can reduce down. Ooh. And you can you can do different things with that if it's not too salty. So, Make yeah. some ramen soup. Yeah, you can do all... I mean, it's pretty usually pretty heavily spiced the way I That's, make it, but yeah. it's... We used to do actually. We used to make scarpariello sauce with the okay. gravy, with with that sometimes. And Anybody heard of scarpariello? Scarpariello, I think, is a fairly New York Italian thing. Well, it's a Sicilian thing. It is a Sicilian thing. Yeah. It's a poor man. It's a poor man's, but it's more. Yeah, it's uh, Southern Italian, and you find it a bunch in New York. And yeah. In the suburbs, and yeah. 
But so it's scarpriello, as in scrap, because that's exactly what it means. Yeah. It's kind of hard to define it because you never know what's going to be in it, honestly. <laughs> but it's usually pretty spicy. Yeah. But, um... Uh, ribs and wings to be done well or done very well, you need to... They're not extremely hard, but you need to pay some attention to them. Yeah. I, I think there's some good, not cheats, but good sort of protocols, recipes to help help it along. But, uh, yeah, you can mess them up real bad and have them tough, have them burned dried out and, and you pretty much ruin it. Too so. much work for the amount of meat. Well, that probably depends on the cut for the ribs, right? That, those well, have that a lot can, of meat on them. Yeah, those are really those. meaty. Um, you can also get country ribs, which you'll find a lot of the grocery stores really, really cheap, sometimes like a buck a pound. They're actually cut from the shoulder, so it's the up, they may have a little bone or not. They, they're kind of cut through the bones haphazard, mm. so you don't get full rib bone, so they call them country ribs. Mm. So not really rib, but it's sort of lower shoulder meat. But it's the same type of thing, so you can treat it the same way, and they're super meaty. Uh, you're just not going to get a specific, nice, you know, present presentable item. But that's that's like your Tuesday dinner, Wednesday dinner uh, way to get uh, something in that category. Green Gables does the country ribs. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, sometimes you get specials on them where they're just... I've seen times when they were 75, 89 cents a pound. Yeah. And they have sometimes almost all meat and very little bone or a little bit of the collagen tips in it. Uh, so you could also cut them up and basically call them rib tips. Or, you know, you could do all kinds of stuff with them. Uh, another good thing if you make, like, um, if you do uh, pork bones or pork um, ribs in your tomato sauce and you do a slow cooked tomato sauce, that's a great way to throw those in there. You're still going to get all the flavor, and you cut the cost down by, like, four times Yeah. Uh, from a, a fancy trimmed-out rib. And, oh, but that really reminds me. I did get into the garden besides to pick strawberries. I was out there a couple hours before my sister arrived and did get some of our greenhouse herbs into the garden. So some of the basil, some of the summer savory, which I learned summer savory goes well with cabbages to keep cabbage worms away. So mm, I planted that. I like savory. It's actually, so savory yeah. is oregano replacement. It's a little less intense than oregano, but similar. Oh, and there was it's, one uh, other. It's not used much here, but it's one of my favorite fresh herbs. It's not real helpful dried. I mean, you okay. can be dried, but I, I really like using it for like Greek salads and tomato cucumber those those type of things and, and i got another going. round of basil in because we have some basil that's starting to get you know halfway basil decent expensive size. pound of basil wholesale i'm just looking checking today it's 15 dollars on the pound wow. and it's 33 dollars on a three pound which is more than i can use so we're trying to grow a decent amount of basil with our tomatoes and peppers and I'm trying to remember what the other herb is that I got in there. And I did, we did have two tomato plants that uh, had died off after transplanting them last time. But I had so many extras that I just replaced them today. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people yeah. are losing starts this year. In fact, they're still just holding so a few at the farmer's market. I don't, the stuff doesn't look that good, but people are still selling starts because things are so behind there. They're, yeah. There's some need for it. I don't know what they're going to produce, but it's, People are definitely putting them in. Yeah, so we have more tomatoes than we need because we started so many in the greenhouse. And same with the peppers. So I might actually put some more paste tomatoes in. I was going to do that today, but uh, ran out of time and it was getting hot and muggy. And I don't deal well, too well with heat. So um, it was not horrible, not like south hot, but it was in the 80s and Did it have, was getting muggy. Do you have anything else from dinner? Or just No, I do have one other picture there. from dinner. I have that one from dinner. You want to explain what the this one too? Well, that's so. yeah. That's just it's a cold. It's a tomato, tomato red wine vinaigrette with various. I guess we had some olives and peppers and celery and some wild asparagus. Too. I had I the one thing that was really local was wild asparagus and um, your pasta. really really thin and yeah. Now I was playing with a new variety, new blend of uh, rye. Rice, spinach, and beet, which I do fresh frozen, but I was working on drying some of that. I actually am not real happy with the dried beet. I'm probably going to just move that out, and do a swap different. in probably some of my tomato or smoked tomato instead, um, because I did not like the coloration of the drying. Yeah. It was also bleeding too much on the on the longer cook period. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, beets do bleed quite They a bleed. Bit. They're very water-soluble, so you just need huge amounts. So yeah. I wasn't surprised, but I really was not happy with 
that. So I, we were just playing with that. So it's a, uh, so it is my pasta, but it's um, yeah. summer picnic salad and lots of fresh asparagus. And oh, there's some garlic scapes in there. Everything else is. Oh, you did put the garlic scapes in I there put too. So many yeah. there. So yeah, I did get a chance to pick and harvest some garlic scapes today. Today as well. You didn't, oh, put, you didn't get a picture of the pie. I did not get a picture of the pie, other than in the background of other things. So no, but you, you should did take pie. pictures of. Oh no, I did. I asked you to take pictures. I of know. The pie. I forgot. I forgot to go back to take pictures of the pie. Um, but you were right there taking it when you took the ribs. It was in the background of a rib picture. Well, that's not taking a picture. No, of the pie. it isn't. Um, so we did have pie. What kind of pie did you make? Maybe or my dad's favorite. Rhubarb pie. Rhubarb. So no strawberries. Straight rhubarb. Straight rhubarb. My dad loves tart rhubarb. Um, so I had just enough for two pies. I had just yeah. just about eight cups. Yeah. So. so that was not our own rhubarb, but it was rhubarb from the farmer's market. Our rhubarb's not doing well. Our rhubarb, yeah, went in last year. It was slow last year, but we didn't worry about it. It was new. Yeah. This year, it, it kind of took off a little bit. It's super, I mean, it's got tiny leaves and rhubarb. Is, it's supposed to get huge. Yeah, it goes. It gets huge. It's useless if it doesn't get large. So, no, so. don't know what's going on. I think it needs a bunch of chicken manure and compost. I think it's it under. Um, Although most of our garden's doing really well, and it did have a bunch of chicken compost back in that area last fall. Yeah. So, so and the sandy soil yeah. and stuff. It's it's traditional soil. Rhubarb grows great around here. You put, it grows like a weed once it establishes. So there's something. Something is not like it. It seems stressed because something's also trying to eat the leaves. And I think we lost one of our two rhubarb yeah. plants. So we need too. to plant a bunch more. And I, I think composting it up uh, at some point and then just seeing what happens. Green Gables wants to know more about the rhubarb pie. So we did a traditional. Actually, I did a lard crust, which I haven't done in forever. I did a lot. I did a two thirds lard, one third butter. butter. Um, so lard or Crisco makes the flakiest hey, um, crust. Lard actually, in some ways, makes some of the most flavorful, but we like the butteriness. Buttery makes your butter makes your crust a little softer because of the small amount of water in butter. Mm. Um, that's that's why Crisco or lard um, outperforms butter in in flaky and texture, just not always flavor. So, uh, of course, you can get butter flavored Crisco. <laughs> Uh, of course, that's margarine. Um, yeah. But you, they actually sell butter-flavored Crisco. I was noticing. Oh, that's um, funny. I didn't buy Crisco. Um, you know, so vegetable, not no non-trans fat vegetable lard. I bought real. I bought lard. real lard, which again I hadn't bought in a long time. Um, so I did a traditional pastry crust and then a chopped up the uh, rhubarb and did a classic rhubarb filling. Yeah. And I used, um, a lot of times people use flour to thicken it. I, I used, um, or cornstarch, uh, I used tapioca flour because it's uh, not gritty and it also sets clear. Okay. Um, so that's that's a nice cheap, it's a little more expensive than definitely flour or cornstarch, but it, um, um, but that's, if you got a little cap tapioca, which is becoming more popular with all the gluten-free and other things going on, um, then, um, yeah, tapioca starch. You can use the pearls, uh, but it can leave little pearls in it, um, which are somewhat noticeable if you use the flour basically one for one. Uh, you get really, really nice set yeah. on your pies. And, of course, you sweeten it because it's really tart otherwise. Well, yeah, you sweeten it. I mean, you always pretty traditional sweetened. I think it was, But it was still pretty fairly tart tasting pie. Was it pie? a cup and a half? A cup and a half of sugar to... Four cups of uh, four loose pack, cup, well, you know, mounded, but with air between it, uh, four cups of fruit. So, yeah. I mean, you could, some commercial pies would probably go almost two cups of sugar, but one and a half is sort of a good starting. A low, you go lower sugar, you can go to one. Like an apple pie, you can go one cup, um, but um, it, it's it's sweet, but it's slightly sweet. Um and then uh, you need some of the sugar to help the pectin and, and the fruit to set uh, also. So. And I'm pulling up a picture of it, which is in the background of a picture of the ribs that were just done. So an unedited picture, so my, don't mind all the stuff around it, but those are the two pies in the background that you made. We gave my dad one of them because we got through half of one today. Yeah. I didn't get a real, I didn't get the top crust real fancy. I had 
made the crust and I had let it sit in the freezer for a little bit to set up, but it was still running a little bit warm, so I was getting a little sticking. I was probably running a little high on the fat. I put, could have put a touch more flour in. I did put an egg in. A lot of crust don't have eggs, but I put one egg in. So I, um, yeah, so I was having a little bit of fall apart, so I patched, patched the top a little bit. Um, so it wasn't a real consistent top, but it was nice. Tina, we have a video. Asaboko is great. We love Asaboko. Oh, did you buy veal, beef, or pork is the question. Yeah. Because real Asaboko is really veal, but, well, you could, I mean, I've had, um, what was it? By, we did bison at one place. So it's, it's a cut, but the most traditional cut is veal. Um, but any of them can be really good. Yes, and we do. Well, you did a sous vide video on Asabuco pork. Oh, yeah. Uh, Which cooks year faster. And a half yeah, that cooks so. faster than. Um, yeah. So, yeah, but that's a, a good way to do it, especially with the pork, which can fall apart. Yeah. You can actually buy pork asabuco or pork shanks um, pre sous vide, you know, pre cooked, that, and they do that, and then you yeah. just warm them up. But what would you suggest? Besides watching that video, what other ways can you make asabuco? So asabuco is a so asabuco is cross cut beef. shank beef. Okay, so it's going to take a little longer to cook, and it's not going to be as mild as veal. Uh, however, it's going to be a bigger and you're going to have a bigger bone in the middle. Middle. So one thing you need to know is you need to serve a large portion, depending on where the bone is. It could take up most of the meat. So you might be serving a pound or more per person, and so. Asabuco is cut through the the shank uh, between the knee and the ankle, and you actually want the there's only three or four good ones on veal uh, because everything else is going too far into the ankle or into the knee joint, and the bone becomes so big that there isn't much meat. Also, you want a bone ideally with a hole with the marrow in it. That's your ideal restaurant cut. Now, if you get the other ones, that's fine. It still tastes good, and actually, you can use those and cook them and pull the meat off. And add more meat to a bowl, or you or pull the meat and use it for something else, and then discard the bones after they're cooked. But yeah, so asabuco cut is cross cut shank, usually cut inch and a half, two inches thick, um, and then you braise it because it's a tough, exercised, full of collagen connective tissue. So you braise it three hours. You know, beef is going to be solid three hours at least to simmering in a flavorful liquid. Uh, so whatever type of gravy base, tomato, you know, sometimes it's done tomato, a lot of times it's done in, in stock or brown stock, um, but you can do it in like a you know, tomato stock base, a um, mm. lot of different things, white wine, red wine, no wine, fruit juice, <laughs> uh, and, and meat stock, and so you let it cook slow, so there, you can flavor up any way you want, the key is to cook it at just barely a simmer until it almost falls off the bone, and then you clean up the sauce by straining out your herbs, getting the extra fat off, uh, and then a lot of times reduce that sauce and, and Ooh, that would be good. season it up and and so coat the meat with it when you serve it. Asabuco is most commonly served, like asabuco milanese is you, you do saffron risotto with it, so saffron rice, uh, but it's basically a stew. You know, it's, a, it's a big braise. So you can do anything from potatoes and vegetables or you know, I've, I've done it all different ways. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, but it, it's a really good item. No, Zark, I haven't not announced anything yet um, as far as gender goes, but that video will I be coming that, soon. I think that was a baiting. I know, it is. <laughs> not being announced today, but will come out very soon. Um, but in general, the baby's pretty good. Um Rhubarb and sugar will basically make a jam or a confit, uh, a confit or a, uh, because there is a high level of pectin and fiber in rhubarb already. Mm. So if you just, it, it starts to fall apart quickly and become stringy. So you can make like a rhubarb sauce, but you got to chop it up because it's like celery. Mm. You know, it's not quite yeah. that stringy. Older styles, people peel them, but that's silly to peel it because I don't find the Michigan rhubarb to be stringy at all. If you peel it, you lose the red. And there is, by the way, green rhubarb and red rhubarb. Yeah. Um, but there, and um, so you can make it into like a sauce, but it will thicken a lot by itself, or a jam, and use it as a spread. Uh, definitely add some sugar; it's awfully tart. Uh, that's why so many people cut it with strawberries, which are seasonally come just a little after the rhubarb starts. Um, 
because you get a nice balancing of flavors and, and, and that's things. what we did last year, year before last year yeah, was uh strawberry, strawberry rhubarb, rhubarb jam. yeah so we did some of that too uh last time but this time we used our oh you got a picture pack. of the oh nice and the part-time program oh we'll have to oh cool did you just do that or we just haven't posted a picture of in the, the last couple hours from this group um cool cool thanks yeah. Um, uh, rhubarb is nice also for making chutneys and I mean, some people dip it in sugar and eat it raw, but typically you, I would gently quickly cook it. Some people candy it and like, you know, dip it in syrup and let it kind of quick candy. So it's hard to keep. It was chunky and very tasty. Yeah. It's very hard. Cause I've tried to put it in sugar syrup, um, and see if I could kind of get it to dehydrate and candy that way. Uh, and if you're really careful, you can, but you get most of the red color comes out of it. So you get a pink syrup. It's hard. It's hard to keep it in a nice condition. Uh, but yeah, it's, um, but you can do sweet tart. So, and I, like I said before, it, it works nice with certain meats, like um, I'd say, you know, like a grilled pork chop, which is really savory and salty. You can, it's a nice finish um, for that. You could do it with chicken, but I'd say, a, I'd say a grilled pork chop would be the that ideal. Um Instead Some, of your apple. Summer grilling um, would be um, cut, cutting that fat with a little bit of a, a rhubarb tart. Um, of some sort. Yeah. That sounds really good, actually. Yeah. Oh, just now put it in. Okay. We'll... Yeah. Yeah. Because you took a picture of it yeah. as it came out. That's awesome. So probably took a screenshot of it. Yeah. But uh, uh, anyway, yes. So we got rhubarb. We got... We still have rhubarb pie. We have half a pie left, so we'll probably share that with your dad because your dad's no, coming No, he up. doesn't eat rhubarb. Oh, I forgot that. Yes. That's the whole point. You have to keep for him us. away from it. For us. He thinks he's allergic to it, but he hasn't had it in many, many years since but the he hasn't had dead. it, yeah. Uh, but he's pretty sure he's allergic. And there are very few people, but there are a few people that have intolerances or allergies. Yeah. It's um, high in oxalic acid. Especially the leaves, which you don't want to can't eat. can't eat the leaves. Uh, they're yeah. extremely high in oxalic acid. They are poisonous. So you need to limit it. But, I mean, it's so tart that you wouldn't eat a huge amount of it. No. But sumac and point. other things have oxalic acid. So And so does the sorrel. Sorrel. Um, so there are things. We just uh, we don't process large amounts of oxalic acid yeah. but they tend internally to be, very well. They tend to be a lot of tart it plants is tart. Yeah. that have, well, the probably taste of it is tart. So you don't eat those in huge amounts most of the time. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, so we have... A number of things there. You can open up to any other questions uh, for Chef if you want. Um, but I'm trying to think if there was anything else. We really didn't get a whole lot done this week because we had a ton of rain. We're probably primarily, when I was outside, I was primarily focused on trying to get as many strawberries as we could. Um, got a few things in the ground. Uh, we have some beans starting to poke up our uh, purple Broad bean is coming those have up. To grow, those have to grow really big because they, they make a big bean. Big so. bean. And we have, I set up a teepee type trellis for them to grow up. And. Oh, the, the, the leaves, are, leaves are totally useless. Yeah. I mean, you can compost. throw them in your compost. Yeah. I don't think even the poultry will eat them, I'm guessing. No, I don't. Th I don't think many animals eat rhubarb leaves. You could probably mulch with them as well. So if you just, instead of yeah, composting, just so go big, straight to mulch. Yeah. Oh, well, that's the, that's yeah. what makes good mulches. Yes, yeah, so there. Tear them up and throw it in there. Um, but yeah, it'll help just build your soil <laughs> with them. Um, yeah, there's a few things like that. Uh, what else did I see coming up? The corn is just starting to come up. Uh, at least some of it is. It's going to have to move fast to be uh, knee high by 4th of July. Yeah, that's not working. Typically, we're well late. above that. Although yes. this, is, this is sweet eating corn, so it actually matures much faster. So yeah. yeah, it'll mature regardless before it gets cold. Yeah, so we'll we'll see how we do on that this year. I didn't have it that much of it. so We're getting um, tons of growth where we planted our forage seeds. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Well, I showed pictures of that last, yeah, last year. Week, the barley, last week. the turnips, the radishes, the yeah, a little bit of peas and other stuff. So all the areas that the chickens heavily ate down over the winter has recovered, and the other and a bunch of other areas we have, we have supplemented. We have squash growing in that area right outside the winter it's coop so too. Well, it's either and squash so or melons. Oh uh, no, I think they're squash because they were I uh, set I scattered seeds oh, that they? were our mystery squash seeds okay um so we'll see what we get there so we do have squash growing although not 
we have some summer squash starting to poke up in the garden. Huh. I started those from bees, seeds. The bees late. use the leaves. Interesting. Huh. Okay. Um, high food forest. Okay. I'm trying to see what else I missed. Use the rhubarb leaves to chew them up and take them back to the hive in battle and, and it battles mites. Okay. I was hearing last the week, week yeah. for those of you that have elephant problems, <laughs> that if you plant beehives strategically or around, place, your, garden. around your garden or <laughs> house, that elephants really dislike Don't like bees, bees <laughs> because they can hear them and sense them and they know there's a lot of them, but they can't see them. I don't know if we have anyone watching from India or Africa. Yeah. We sometimes get someone from Scotland, but so, I don't think any. I don't think Scotland has any elephants. <laughs> no, I was just thinking other countries. But there is. And the uh, Canada, of course. Yeah. Yeah, so I was saying there, you, know, you can obviously put up big perimeter defenses and walls, which are hard to maintain, but um, bees are one method if strategically used, can pretty easily you know, work to repel them because they just really annoy you. The elephants. the elephants, or maybe they've kicked them over at some point or whatever. And Probably they... don't like getting stung. Yeah, so that's that's a... And then, of course, you can harvest honey. Well, the other thing I would suspect is that if they get near the beehives, they, they, they're they walking, shakes the ground, it probably... Uh... Stirs up the bees, and the bees start swarming. and Yeah, that probably wouldn't be good. Yeah, and so they really dislike that's the bees. That's too funny. Anyway. But again, their eyesight guys... isn't great, so they can't see them. They're yeah. moving all over. For any of you guys who have elephant problems in your area, yes. <laughs> that's too funny. That is one thing we'd eventually like to have our bees. Um, it's on the down the road to do list. And I'm guessing it's, time, it's not time this year. It's a, probably what a thousand to two thousand dollar investment. Oh, I mean, it depends on if you make your own yeah, you hives, get, you buy all the you stuff. You got to do the hives, got to do the equipment. You, get it used. you need a suit. Yes, you need a suit. And some other things. So there's some money as well as time. Yeah. So probably not happening in the next I'm going to guess that the bee, the elf, I mean, they have tough skin in a lot of areas, but they have areas around their face and eyes, nose, yeah. uh, mouth. And, and of course, there's you can get bees in your mouth. I'm guessing some of the things wouldn't bother them much, but yeah, the bees know. probably know where to go and, and can give them a little trouble. Uh, I don't think the bees keep or the Or may just away. be the buzzing, uh, may just be the buzzing in their ears, you yeah. know. I don't think the bees keep the bears away, though. Because the bears like the honey, and they seem to put up with the bee stings to get the honey. Oh, yeah. Did, Tina, did you get all your blueberry bushes? Yeah. Oh, you got oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a lot of blueberry bushes. You know, put a whole food forest in front, and a whole lot of trees is, um, is um, oh, what's his name in, in Vicksburg? Um, oh, Jamie? Jamie. Yeah, yeah, Jamie and, and uh, Jamie Sasha. Jamie doesn't have a channel, but. Yeah, Jamie and Sasha put in, they had. D4, they didn't have four, but they took down a lot of their stuff and stumps. Um, and they had, they were showing, they were starting to put stuff in early this spring, but yeah. they had all, for a, a smaller area, they had a nice selection of things they're putting in there. Yeah. So they're doing orchard. They had some there. heavy power line work before that. So they wanted that to clear before they put things yeah. in beyond that or, or lower trees that might come underneath it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Things we talked about on live shows. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, we need some more blueberry bushes, although I will say our transplanted, yeah, we, we have one transplanted wild blueberry bush that uh, started making blueberries this year. I did pull them off just because I want it to develop more of a root system before we really let it go because it's still small and struggling. Um, we do have blueberries we'll have to check on. Um, the one, the one bush, bush out that, of the five yeah. or six that we started with a few years ago that's yeah. surviving. Um, the chickens. Very small, but it's going to bear heavily on the very small amount branches that it has. Yeah, so we'll get some blueberries this year. Um, our strawberries are so late. They're usually early June. So the next fruit that ripens here, wild fruit that ripens, are our black raspberries, which I think Noah's Ark mentioned earlier. We have earlier. mulberries ripe in the front of the house right now. Are they right now? Yeah, when okay. I drove through there with the tractor. We don't really like them, so we don't. Yeah, they're okay. But we talked about that before. I am not a fan. I find it's not a, an item that I would plant. And even when we have them showing up wild, I like to restrict them heavily because, yeah, they're not my favorite item. They're not yeah. the end of the world. But, but um, usually for my dad's birthday, usually it's black raspberries that we have ripe. 
and mm -hmm. they are getting big, but they're not they're turning close, color yet. Yeah. So they probably be another week or two before they start. Yeah. Um, alk oh, alkaline soil. No, they're usually like acidic soil. Um, yeah, the blueberries like acidic soil. Well, grapes love limestone. They absolutely love limestone. Yeah. And actually, grapes, once established, um, send roots sometimes 30, 40 feet deep in limestone. So with limited, you know, after limited watering and getting them established, they will go dig for water and will grow in even surprisingly difficult conditions. Yeah. Um, sometimes if you're so arid, you may have to supplement them a little bit, but you might be able to get some, especially wine, you know, we're not talking water, so sweet eating grapes, we're talking wine grapes, so the ones that really dig and you want to stress them. Tina, post pics in the group, have a bunch wow. of fig trees to plant also on a ninth of an acre. Wow, that's a lot to put in there. Um, 24 jams of, jars of blueberry jam, that sounds good. Yeah. Our strawberries are, they usually, naturally they're growing under our hardwoods, not our pine. So they're probably not as acidic, but um, they tend to grow under, well, where they're growing on our property naturally would be under our oak trees in back. That's mainly oaks in that area. We actually have some sassafras in that area as well. A lot of sassafras. Um, so what I do every fall, which I didn't do last fall, but I should do this fall again, is I was taking some of the leaves that fell because usually they self mulch under those trees. So I was taking some leaves that fell and put them straight on the strawberry bed and mulch it with the leaves instead of with straw because that's what happens naturally. So I was trying to mimic it and the strawberries in the strawberry bed are going nuts. So, um, but almost done. So we're going to move on to our blackberries next and then, or not blackberries, black raspberries. And then after that, we get our dewberries. So July will probably be black raspberry and dewberry picking time. And those are all wild we plants. We had a bad season last year because it dried out. I think we're going to do just fine this year. Yeah. Maybe we'll get a good one. Yeah, I see a lot of uh, dewberries well, growing. Yeah, it looks like they're going to be big and nice. And there is another field out back that we should check out too um, yeah. that is completely all dewberry covered. So that one we could probably we could probably get tons of dewberries if they're, if they're ripening well. Um, and then another thing that will be in the fall will be our autumn olives because we have lots of autumn olives out back as well. Um, which, by the way, autumn olives, many states you're not allowed to plant it because it's considered invasive, including Michigan. But you can get gummy berries, which ripen about now and are a related plant, but not so uh, aggressive as far as growing. They don't grow by runners or anything. Um, and they... Uh, they they ripen a little earlier in the season. So I know uh, Mike Hogue at, at Lily House was actually uh, showing pictures of ripe uh, gummy berries mm. at this point. So blueberry recipes. Blueberries. Uh, I mean, they're probably best just plain. I don't mind them as jam, although they can be a little. See, they make nice comp and they make really good pies. That's yeah. My favorite pie, I think I mentioned peach before, is a peach blueberry. That's a good blend, uh, which are usually a crossover end of blueberries, beginning of peaches. Mm -hmm. uh, so you you balance out the tartness and sometimes monotonous of a peach, which is still a good pie, with the extra tartness and the complexity of the blueberry, which can be a little seedy and over overpowering. So you put the two together, you get just about a perfect pie. No, Kiri, ground cherries do not taste like tree cherries. Um, but Nat King cherries do. Uh, yeah, I think those are like a maybe a tart type. Yeah. Uh, but those they are, are bush cherries. Yeah. Um, the ground cherries are actually sweet a nightshade. And sort of a tropical. Depending on how hot and what variety, they can taste very tropical. But they're always sweet sour. Yeah, but you have not like gooseberries, not like the green gooseberries, which are just sour, 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 and have to be heavily sugared. Yeah. Cape gooseberries can be eaten. Cape gooseberry is another name for ground cherry. Yep. Uh, ground cherries. Um, there's two primary types that are cultivated, I believe. I think we have the Molly's variety, and you have to wait until basically they have a husk like. Um, they look like a really small tomatillo. Yeah, they do. But they're orange. They turn orange. The husk and everything will actually turn 
brown when the inside mm -hmm. turns orange. You want them really orange before you pick them or they're going to be sour. But once they're really ripe, they're actually kind of pineapple-y. You get some pineapple-y, mango-y uh, tartness. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of complex, a little bit funky. I found the ones that are imported from Israel or Australia or New Zealand, which is where I've gotten commercial ones. They're twice the size. They're, because of the hotter climate, I think, or their varieties, they're more tropical yeah. than ours. But even these are, are pretty tropical tasting for our climate. Yeah. And they're, they're definitely really good. You can make... You know, chutneys with them. You can make salsas with them. Uh, you can eat them straight off the elephant ground. Stew. The pro yeah, elephant stew. Well, I'm, if you train to cook by by cuts, uh, by the cut and by the tenderness and flavor, you can cook anything. But yeah, I've never handled elephant. I'm not <laughs> not really looking to do that. No. Nope. Uh, and you only get two ears off of it, so that's limiting. Oh, that's elephant ears. Yeah. But uh, okay, who's don't like tree cherries. Grew up in the house with cherry tree. In we the have backyard. premium black cherries growing yes. this year. We get a lot of tart cherries, which are good too, in and some area. white, you know, white or rainier style, and some other the the uh, Morello Italian cherries. And but uh, what really goes great is the dark cherries. Um, in fact, much of the frozen and canned dark cherries in the country come from Michigan. Um, think we produce more cherries in Washington and Oregon uh, in the dark, in the tart cherries, I believe. Uh, but again, most of them are going to, you know, to canning pies and commercial use. So you, and you do see some in bags, but less. Rainier are my favorite, but they're expensive. Okay. Yeah, the Rainiers are expensive. It seems like we grow a llama around here, though. They're not a lot more expensive than, than, um, yeah. Oh, we made a whole bunch of brandy cherries last year. We've heard, I think we maybe opened one container. I bet I've got like four or oh, five yeah. of them down there. Which are actually kind of nice to let them go for about six months to a year. Yeah. I don't think they change much after that. They let, but over but Yeah, we have. So if anybody or... likes a Manhattan or, <laughs> or a, uh, uh, and then the juice that comes with it, which is generous because they shed off so much juice. Um, it, it's perfect Thanks, for a course. fancy cocktail, but um, pretty good over some ice cream too. Or other, you know, we're making desserts. Thanks, Noah. We Ozark. just make a few, though. I made a pints. I do like six pints or something. No, we did quarts. Maybe it's like we six We may have quarts. given one or two away, too. I gave one to Tony and Carol. Yeah. I'm going to ask them if they dug into that. I think they did at some point. I'm sure yeah. they did. Yeah. No, yeah, we good. don't really give many of those away because uh, I just make a few. And they're expensive. First, the cherries are expensive. I have to hand pit them all. And then you got to put the brandy in and make the syrup and the spices. It ends up being pretty pricey. But if you've ever tried to buy that stuff uh, for, you know, finishing cocktails and things, they're extremely expensive commercially, and they're not always that good always. You know, yeah. So, Have you ever made your own maraschino cherries? Well, so maraschino cherries as we know them is a commercial product. The actual maraschino liquid or maraschino cherries um, that you get in Italy are sort of like the Morello, some of the others. That's similar to what our brandy cherry is. Um, the raspberries aren't ready yet. Yeah, they're going to be. We'll see, but I don't Delayed. think. Yeah, I don't think we're going to have them. It's so probably going to be another week or two before they're ripening. Yeah, yeah. but um, soon. But I think he's here a week early. But yeah, so the maraschino cherries that you think of for kind of in the big jug ice cream topper. That is a commercial cherry. Um, I think it might be a more of a lighter colored cherry, but they you actually bleach it. They chemically bleach them so they're clear or white. And then they flavor, sweeten, preserve, you know, firm them up with chemical methods, and they um, color them. It's an extremely fake. <laughs> it's fake all the way around. Yeah. Um, and they have almost no bearing on the flavor profile of the Italian uh, ones. You can buy the maraschino liquid, uh, the maraschino uh, liqueur, uh, in you know your more diverse liquor beverage stores. Uh, it's like there might be a few drinks that's but but it's mostly used as a dessert, mm -hmm. uh, as an ingredient. Uh, I wouldn't say a lot of people are drinking it. Uh, in fact, I've never <laughs> I've used it in in finishing. Uh, you know, finishing things, but yeah. 
And White Picket Fence says, can they ask a noodle question? It's almost 10 o'clock. Yeah, yeah. Or is it too late? Wait for next week. Yeah, we can wait. Go ahead and ask the noodle question. And as far they as... They are fake. That's why they, they're totally <laughs> fake. Every bit of that color and it's fake, yes. yes. And as far as where is Puddin', which Nora's Ark is asking, come here, Mike. I don't know if you can see that head back there. She's, She's on the sleeping. couch right there. She is completely using the pillows on the couch as a pillow. Um, and out because she gets she gets nervous when strangers come but she did really well with my parents um she got a little scared of holly but she did take some little bits of rib from holly which yeah. was a first yeah you can definitely do a candied cherry either in a heavy heavy syrup or candied down even more um that's absolutely fine in fact maraschino cherries the dessert ones Ice cream toppings, they have no alcohol. They're not processed with alcohol. Um, the original ones uh, probably were. But, yeah, you can. So you could take any form of nice cherry that you like, and you could um, do a heavy syrup. Now, what will happen, even if you do a very heavy boiled syrup, like a two and a half to one, or a, you can almost get a three to one, um, you pull so much liquid out of the cherries that it's going to really loosen it up. So you need as as thick of a syrup as you can get, but you can you can pit them, you can drop them in there, you can spice it. Um, you know, with we use citrus peel and cinnamon and star anise and things in our in our brandy cherry. It's a recipe from a chef that very close to a recipe from a chef that I worked with, uh, who really loved doing them. It's Italian background, and so you could think about a spice drop or all the things that go in some of those things. You could add a little bit of that to bring the nuance of sweet and cherry to a little more balanced. Uh, but you could do it. It works just fine without any alcohol. Welcome, Renell Suburban Homestead. We are wrapping up for the night, but White Picket Fence does have one other cooking question. She is going to make, or she, I assumed that was a she. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Going to we make lo mein. Discuss, never did discuss what um, the, the variations on, on purchasing rib. Oh, yes. yeah, no, but the, we, we can, can come nobody, back to that. We'll go back to that. Some Remind yeah. us sometime if next, anybody's interested. Next weekend might actually be good because it's the weekend before the 4th of July. Heading into 4th of July, yeah. So, so we could talk barbecue next weekend, maybe. Uh, but she is making lo mein for the first time. Is there a certain noodle she should buy for it? Yeah, so they sell lo mein's. Uh, lo mein is basically a Chinese... Then it's between a, it can be a, it's like a linguine, so a medium sized linguine. So you could actually use spaghetti or linguine, uh, and I've done that for staff meals and stir fries and things in restaurants. Um, just undercook it slightly, but not full al dente. That works just fine if that's all you have. Uh, if you're being frugal or you know want to quick want to do a quick stir fry noodle, um, cook it obviously before you use it. Um, but an Asian lo mein is either white or yellow. Uh, yellow because they put heavy food dye in it. Typically, there's no egg in it, although sometimes they can have egg in it. And it uses a finer Night flour time. that's lower gluten, um, so it can be a little more brittle. And then sometimes they alkaline treat it, uh, which causes it to firm up. Um, and that is by changing the pH. That's basically what a ramen noodle is. Um, but there's, so there's a whole bunch of types of lo mains, and then there's a whole bunch more Chinese noodles, which then convert it into Japanese lo mein. So there's tremendous variety quickly diverges from a very simple, uh, a very simple noodle. So yeah, if you want to buy an Asian noodle lo mein, uh, it'll come sometimes wrapped up with a little band or a little plastic band, or, or it used to be a little ribbon around it. Um, those, if you want to play with that, that's fine, but you can, um, <laughs> Can you see her? Oh, there she's she is. peeking. She's peeking. She woke up a little bit. Yeah, so that's it. Um, and then um, start your stuff. Stir, you know, stir fry your main items. So they soften just halfway, and then, and then throw uh, the on high heat, uh, throw in the noodles, not soaking wet. Use a decent amount of oil, and then whatever your pre-made sauce or your soy or sesame or whatever. And uh, yeah, it's a good quick throw together. Nice alternative from other types of pasta. You can use up leftovers. It's very cost effective. I do huge batches for buffets or for um, staff meal when we had to feed like 20 or 30 people. A huge, yeah. huge griddle full of it. Um, don't do too much at a time or you'll lose your heat, like stir frying rice. <laughs> but treat it just like doing, doing stir fried rice. 
yeah. and then you can obviously add anything in it from your garden. Uh, it's easy to build. Yeah, yeah. So oh, keep yeah. your broccoli out of your stir fries. Broccoli gives off tremendous amounts of water. Everybody thinks okay. you stir fry broccoli. There's a lot of broccoli used in American Chinese food. What you might notice is it's it's actually steamed, and typically they add the broccoli in on the top of your dish. The broccoli actually isn't stir fried because we all know that broccoli gets nasty and mushy. Yeah. So keep that to the side, but other things go in there great. Yeah. Okay, so I think that's probably the last cooking question of tonight because <clears throat> I do have, well, I don't just have to work tomorrow. I actually have to go in a little early tomorrow. So we will wrap up close to on time. For those of you guys who joined in late, uh, just a reminder, we usually start at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, every Sunday night. So, but we did have a few. Oh, and remind me some other time to talk about dark soy, black soy, mushroom soy, uh, oh, all other soys. soys. Those are typically the things that in your stir fries cause the color change to be darker and changes some of the flavors. Um, because you can use some regular soy or that's a component, but if you use so much regular straight soy to make it dark, like you see in some of the restaurants, That'd it will be, really be so salty. salty because you're actually using something else. Yeah. So, so that's something to talk about at some point. Yes. Yeah, so next weekend we'll probably have, well, sh we should do a barbecue uh, talk next weekend and do, a, do like a topic of the week next weekend is barbecue. So because 4th of July, I hope you guys uh, definitely have a good week in between. We will be here next week, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, and we might have some information that comes out in between. So you'll have to keep your eye out on our videos if you're looking for updates on other things. Um, but we will definitely see you next week. I hope everybody has a good night and a good week. Yep. Good night. Take care, guys.